Hi everyone, Mike Malatesta here and welcome back to the How Did It Happen podcast. On this podcast, I dig in deep with every guest to explore the roots of their success, to discover not just how it happened, but why it matters. My mission is to find and share stories that inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. Today's episode is part two of my conversation with Brett Johnson a cyber criminal turned cyber crime expert. If you haven't yet listened to part one, you should, as you will want to know all of this man's story. It's a great one. In part two, we talk about Brett going to and escaping from prison, how he invented his tax return identity fraud, marrying Elizabeth the stripper, that's a crazy story, and most importantly, how he turned his life around. It was no longer thirty to 40000 a month. It was thirty to 40000 a day. I was the only guy publicly mentioned as getting away. They picked me up four months later and they give me a job. And I'm the guy that continues to break the law from inside Secret Service offices for the next 10 months. Brett's story is crazy, criminal, creepy. Yeah, he's had some creepy in his life and ultimately courageous. I know you're going to love this one. Enjoy. It, see, it seems like it's escalating. You got, you've got um, shadow crew working. It's a coordinated effort. You can pretty much right. get into all kinds of things. You know who to recruit. You know how to maximize. You know how to social engineer. You know how to do all the things that you're doing. And it it starts to, if I remember from when I heard you before, it starts to really start bringing in some big money. Like from it the, does. the ATMs, I remember... Some, something that had to do with ATMs. And I don't know if it was what you just just described or was it something different? Something different, like, something different. Yeah, so so what did it escalate into before I get into the redemption? And I want to make sure we spend time on redemption. A couple of things. Um, so you're absolutely right. The, it, once, it was like a field of dreams for criminals. If you build it, they will come. At the same time, there was a Ukrainian guy by the name of Dmitry Golubov. He's the, he's the guy who basically is responsible for the genesis of modern credit card theft as we know it today. He he saw the success that I was having with my sites. He was a spammer. He was getting all his credit card de- details, and he, he had this idea. He was like, I wonder if people will buy stolen credit card details, and they will. So he picks. He literally picks up the phone. He calls his buddies. They call their buddies. They end up having a physical conference in Odessa. A hundred of a hundred and fifty of these Ukrainian cyber criminals. They show up and they launch this thing called Carter Planet, which is the genesis of all modern credit card theft as we know it. Now you remember I talked about the. Th- three necessities of cybercrime, gathering data, committing crime, cashing out. One of the reasons that it's never a single attacker which victimizes you is because some of these criminals are in geographic areas where they cannot fulfill one of those three necessities, like money laundering. So the Ukrainians, they had all the credit card details on the planet. They knew how to commit the crime because it was very easy to commit, but they could not cash anything out because there had been so much fraud on that side of Europe that the card companies had literally shut down every card. If you were even the legitimate card holder, you couldn't pull cash out of an ATM. Mm-hmm. So Dimitri ends up partnering. He comes to Shadow. He comes to Carter Planet. It was, Carter Planet was the first website. He comes to me over there. I ended up bringing the Ukrainians into the into the English speaking communities, and we had this partnership. So when you were talking about ATMs, we were doing a lot of phishing. All right, before this hack comes into play. We would fish people out. And back then when we were fishing, you could ask them 20 different things and they would give you all of this information. So we were getting card numbers, account numbers. We were getting pins, passwords, everything else across the board. We were getting card numbers and pins. For you to encode that on a counterfeit credit card or a counterfeit debit card, you have to have complete track two information. Now, track two is the card number. There's a forward slash. And then there's a 16 digit algorithm out beside of that. You have to know that algorithm. You can't guess it. You can't generate it. You have to know it. What we found out through testing is that none, and I mean none, of the banks had implemented the hash on track two, meaning that we had the card number. So we could take the card number, put a forward slash, any 16 digits out beside of it, it would encode. You could take it to an ATM, start pulling cash out because we had the pin as well. That profit right there, before we found out, that was called the CVV1 hack. Before we discovered that, the only thing we were doing was CPN fraud, card or CNP fraud, card not present. That's when you use stolen credit card information, get online, order the laptop, get it in, resell it. Yep. A good carter doing that would profit thirty to $40,000 a month. Once the CVV1 came out, 
it was no longer thirty to forty thousand a month. It was thirty to forty thousand a day, and that is what got a lot of law enforcement attention at that point. So that that was that was what you're talking about. That the Shadow Crew ends up making the front cover of Forbes. August 2004, headline, Who's Stealing Your Identity? October 26, 2004, the United States Secret Service, they arrested 33 people, six countries, six hours. I was the only guy publicly mentioned as getting away. They pick me up four months later, and they give me a job. And I'm the guy that continues to break the law from inside Secret Service offices for the next 10 months until they find out about it. I take off on a cross-country crime spree, still $600,000 in the space of four months, wind up on the United States Most Wanted list, go to Disney World, get arrested, sent to prison, escape from prison, get arrested again, and finally served out my time. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to ask a dumb question here. <laughs> no, no, you're, no, you're not. You're not. <laughs> the the credit cards that you were stealing how how do you get the pins so you described how you get the you created the algorithm because it was basically a hole that they left open right, right. you needed a 16 digit number but they never assigned one and so you could right. put in anyone and it worked right well what about right. the pin itself we we were fishing that out back then you could ask people their pins on that that email that you get saying you know we, your security's been okay. compromised we need to update the profile you would ask name social driver's license uh, mother's maiden address history logins i mean you would ask all this stuff and, and, and you're selling these didn't. cards to people brett and you, they're just going to any atm they can go to putting it in putting the pin in guessing at how much they can take out and right Right. Taking so the it way out. it worked, the Ukrainians typically had most of that information. Remember, they could not pull cash out in the Ukraine. So yep. they had to partner with Money Mule's stateside. And typically what would happen is Ukrainians would keep 60 to 70 percent of the money that would come out of the ATMs. The Money Mule would keep 30 to 40 percent. Now, the question always comes up, well, why wouldn't the Money Mule just keep everything? What you find out is if you know, as a criminal, as a money mule, if you know that that money is going to keep coming, you're not going to cut your own throat at that. And the money kept coming. Now, you would have people that would rip these Ukrainians off. You would certainly have that. But the numbers were very small. The Cost of doing business, like you said right. before. Cost yeah. of doing business. You just chalk it up and go from there. Now, that being said, when I ran Shadow Crew, we were not a violent crew at all, at all. Toward the last days of Shadow Crew, we became violent. Uh, Dmitry Golubov, the uh, head of Carter Planet, that Ukrainian guy, he comes on Shadow Crew one day and he starts posting these pictures. And he had had a guy kidnapped and tortured and he photographed it all. And the guy had ripped him off. Mm -hmm. And um, he sent the message, hey, don't ever rip me off again. So that's, that's where we started to see violence coming in. These days on these forums and marketplaces, violence is absolutely inherent. Uh, you know, you've got drugs that are involved in there. You've got uh, people know that um, some of these guys that are being convicted serve life sentences. So what would you do in order to not serve life in prison? Yeah, you might commit some violence. Uh, so violence is absolutely inherent in cybercrime systems these days. And are cartels using these kinds of systems now to sell drugs? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Yeah, you've got the cartels, you've got all types of organized criminal environments or organizations in there. Of course, the first uh, the first criminal organizations were the Ukrainians and the Russians that were coming into these environments. But then you had the Italians start to figure it out. Then finally, you had the Crips, the Bloods, all, everything else, and then the cartels understanding the profit potential. If you think about it, you know it's a hell of a lot easier to sell drugs online than it is to have a crew standing at a street corner someplace mm -hmm. slinging dope like that. So the, the and, and it took law enforcement a long time to realize that was what was going on. Now you've got, you know, nowadays law enforcement is very good about uh, combating drug trafficking, things like that on, that's online. But still, it's much safer for drug dealers to do it online than it is on street corners. And so these money mules are, well, I guess two things. One, are they easy to track by activity, like for the law enforcement? Like you're going around to ATMs, you're taking money out. I mean, they have to be able to sort of- That's an excellent question. And the answer is, is, hey, it's it's actually where you catch somebody, you catch them, you catch them in the commission of the crime, or you catch them cash, cash, cashing things out, laundering the mm -hmm. money. And it's not, it's not difficult. Now, the problem is, I'll, I'll give you some numbers, okay? In the United States, we've got 37,000 FBI field agents spread across 56 field offices. 
Of those 37,000 agents, only about 200 of them are concentrated on cybercrime. Meanwhile, you've got cybercrime communities that some of these communities are millions of members large. Yeah. So you've got 200 agents versus all these numbers. So the, the numbers are stacked against law enforcement. During the pandemic, the SBA had a total of 29 investigators trying to handle all of that PPP fraud that was coming through. So the numbers are absolutely stacked against these people. At the same time, the internet lends itself to anonymity, especially if you're using the Tor browser or Telegram or things like that. It's very hard to identify these people. You have to make, make you have to wait for them to make a mistake. Not only that, but you've got jurisdictional problems. You know, if a criminal is in the Ukraine or in Russia, eh, are you going to get that guy? Probably not. Even if you identify who that person is, you're not going to get them. Right. Not only that, but if they're, what type of crypto are they using to move value? If they're using Bitcoin, yeah, you can track that. If they're using Monero, no, you can't track that. That's anonymous as anonymous can be. So you've got all these issues that pop up across the way. So there's no blockchain with Monero? It's there, The blockchain is anonymous. There is a blockchain, but it's but anonymous. It's not, you don't know no. who's, who's doing what, and you can't track that. Add in, too, that our society is very good about blaming the victim for the crimes that are perpetrated upon them, especially when we're talking about cybercrime. You hear it all the time. Why would you click on that link? Why would you send money to someone you don't know? Why would you ever believe gift cards? So they tend to blame the victim. And what does that cause? That causes the victim not to report to law enforcement, not to share that they've been victimized. So that that gives a free ride to a lot of criminals that are out yeah. there. It's not just individuals, though. We see it in corporations. We see corporations that don't prosecute because they're afraid that's going to destroy trust in their brand. So that all these things together creates a lot of success on the criminal side. Yeah, it's almost like they want to sign an NDA with the criminal on the yeah. on the ransom. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, we'll Absolutely. pay, but you can't say anything about this and you have to give us our data back. That brings up an example like from like real world today that and I can't remember his name, but there's there, there's uh, a guy who stole 100 million in crypto. Right. Who is his defense is that they had a hole in their in their protocol and all yeah. I did all I did was find the hole and it allowed me to take the money. Where's the crime? Yeah, that's that's the crime. <laughs> well, yeah, but he's trying to say that's not a crime because the the crime is he's trying to blame them, right? Yeah, and he's trying to blame the victim. He's trying to say, <laughs> yeah, that, was, they had the hole there. It's like yeah. they had their door open. Well, you chose to walk in and right. take it. You're the criminal. They are not. You're the criminal. You know, it, it, and that's the thing I say all the time. It doesn't matter. I don't care what that victim has done. I do not care. I don't care if somebody has left their door wide open and they've left a sign in the front yard saying, hey, hey, I got 10 Rolexes inside. Yeah. It is still the criminal's fault that that crime happened. The criminal oh, has to actively choice. choose right. to come in and commit that crime every step of the way, every step of the way. So it, it's never the victim's fault that they're victimized. I don't believe that whatsoever. And you mentioned that Shadow Crew got violent near the near the end and i was wondering you personally you had this experience with this woman when you were 15 right. and, but have you ever have you been violent since then because everything no. else that you've talked about has been like it's not you know not using your hands right. and your fist you're using your brain to like no I, i've never been violent after that at all yeah okay so you're working for the secret service you get arrested you're working for the secret service but you're you're still working for yourself Sure. I guess. What, what, what Still is, moonlighting. Yeah. Yeah. Moonlighting. Yeah. Good <laughs> yeah. Stuff. You know, every everybody needs like a you know like side job or a, yeah yeah a little side hustle hustle right side hustle <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what were you doing? What did they have you doing as a like? Why didn't they just prosecute you and say have, have a good sentence? Sure. And, the reason they didn't prosecute me is because I was the the guy. I was the top of the food chain, bar none, in cybercrime. And no one knew I had been arrested. So you take the top guy and you're going to get some tra some traffic coming to me. All right. I had avoided arrest on the Shadow Crew bust because for a few things, we, we first started to see IPs coming in from government organizations, from law enforcement, from Pentagon, everything else that was looking at Shadow Crew. We started to see our name being mentioned on local law enforcement sites. Hmm. Not only that, but we had a member who had intercepted text messages from the United States Secret Service talking about investigating us. I was the guy that was the head of that, 
and I got worried about RICO. I was like, man, I'm going to be looked at for racketeering. Every crime that everybody's being committed that, that that's being yeah. committed is going to come on my head. The, Tony Soprano's biggest fear. That that was my worry. And, RICO uh, protocol. Yeah. At the at about the same time, I'm also the guy that created this. I've got a whole list of first when cybercrime pops up. But one of the one of my crimes that I that I invented was this thing called tax return identity theft. So the reason everyone's re tax return is delayed every single year is the SOB that's talking to you right now. I'm the guy that created that. I was stealing 160k a week. 10 months out of the year. So I had money coming in. I'm worried about Shadow Crew getting popped. So I retire. And that's what kept me from being arrested when Shadow Crew gets, gets popped. We didn't know. My, my forum techie was a guy named Albert Gonzalez. Albert was involved in the CBV1 hack. So we didn't know that one day he's in New Jersey, broad daylight, standing at an ATM for 40 minutes, pulling cash out. He's got a stack of white Counterfeit cards. Okay. He's putting one card in, pulling $20 bills out, stuffing it in a backpack. All right. Broad daylight. Meanwhile, it just so happens across the street, two New Jersey cops are sitting there and they start watching this kid for 40 minutes until finally one cop looks at the other. Let me go see what this guy is doing. He walks up to Albert. Albert's got a disguise on. He's got this long wig on, everything else. Ask him, kid, what are you doing? Albert falls apart right there. We didn't know that it happened. Albert flips, goes to work for the Secret Service. Now, the truth of the matter is, is back then, we were not horribly sophisticated. We were on some things. Law enforcement was not horribly sophisticated either. They didn't really know what was going on. Albert educates them on a whole host of things. And they ended oh. up asking him, hey, how would you catch these guys? And Albert's like, well, have you ever tried a VPN? And they they had to ask him, what's a VPN? <laughs> So they tell it. He tells them, and they were like, "That's a good idea." Well, I had stepped aside and retired before that took place. Albert comes back into Shadow Crew, and he t and I had left people in charge with with Shadow Crew. I had left admins, mods, everything else in charge. Anybody that disagreed with Albert, he just banned them. So most of the admins that I had in, he kicks out. Most of the mods, he kicks out, and he tells everybody that stays, he's like, "Hey, I've got a VPN. We need to be safe." Every every bit of transaction is going to go through this VPN. Well, mm -hmm. the VPN was owned by the Secret Service. Secret Service captures all the drop addresses, names, transactions, everything else. And that's where you ended up getting 33 people indicted at that point in time. Okay. okay. So they find out that you're side hustling them. And I guess, is that when you, is that they end the relationship? <laughs> <I guess. laughs> that's a nice <laughs> euphemism. <laughs> so <laughs> what happens is, is... My first wife, I was married to Susan for nine years, and I lied to that woman every single day of those nine years. It took her three years to find out that I was a criminal. The next six years, I, I kept telling her, hey, I've stopped. I will stop. I'm going to stop just a little while longer until finally it got to the point of me looking at her and saying, hey, you like spending money, don't you? And mm -hmm. she figured I wasn't going to quit, and I wasn't going to quit. So she leaves me, and that fear that I have of being abandoned yeah. became real. You know, I caused it. That doesn't make it less real. So I was in Charleston, South Carolina. My wife leaves. I go through this deep, dark depression, start getting suicidal, realized I was getting suicidal, picked up the phone, called this criminal psychologist, told her everything, crying on the phone to her. She was like, hey, come on in now. And I was like, yeah, OK. So I go in, <laughs> tell her everything. She's trying to get me to <laughs> this, this lady's trying to get me to stop breaking the law and to go into real estate. And I'm like, is there a difference? And uh, yeah, yeah. You like that one. I also bank with Wells Fargo because I believe one criminal deserves another. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, nice. So, it's, uh, I saw her for about four months and, and honestly, she did some good. She really did. Um, the problem was, is I got lonely one night and I got horny one night. I had, I was 34. I had never been to a strip club in my life. And I was like, tonight's the night. So I walked in and uh, I'm literally the guy that falls in love with the first stripper that he sees. Mm -hmm. And uh, she Meant walked to by. Be. Oh, yeah. She walked by. I'm like, ha, that's the one for me. So I moved her in with me. After I moved her in with me, I found out she was addicted to cocaine, not only addicted to coke, but she was prostituting herself to support the habit. And uh, I loved the hell out of that woman. I did. I mean, I truly did. 
I got it in my head that if I could fix her, that everything would be all right. Maybe I could fix myself. I didn't realize I was, I was naive back then. I didn't realize that, you know, you can't fix other people. You're lucky mm-hmm. to be able to fix yourself. But I, I had it in my head to do that. And I also had it in my head that, uh, you know, if I just kept going, that it would work out, that, that, you know, we'd be in love and we'd be with each other. Um, also got it in my head that if I could just give her whatever she wanted, it'd take her mind off the drugs and she'd be okay. So I quickly went through all of my stateside cash. I had laundered all my money over to uh, Estonia. Quickly went through all the stateside cash at about the same time that Shadow Crew gets popped. So the way I get caught, Elizabeth was like, what was that woman's name? She had high taste. So she, I got engaged to her. She wanted Tiffany engagement rings. So I didn't have the money. I went through all my stateside cash. At the same time, Shadow Crew gets popped. So I couldn't go in at the same time. It was the time of year because you can't file income taxes after October 15th. So I couldn't commit tax fraud. That season was over. I couldn't go into credit card theft because Secret Service had busted everyone on the planet. and You didn't know who to trust anyone anymore. So the only thing I was left was running paper, counterfeit cashier's checks. So I started running counterfeit cashier's checks and I'd always preached, don't ever do that. The the rules are you never run paper. You never act out of desperation. And I ended up doing both. And that's what got me arrested was, I mean, I was going to get arrested anyway, let's be fair. But what, what accelerated that arrest was absolutely those, those things right there. All right. So I got arrested. My turnaround, of course, that relationship falls apart. But um, my sister, because of my relationship with Elizabeth, my sister had disowned me. My sister went through an entire year, over a year, of just not speaking to me. Wouldn't take a phone call, wouldn't do anything else. Not because I was a criminal. She knew that. But that line in the sand was the stripper. <laughs> you know, she was like, so, oh, no. So for Go her, ahead. it was about Elizabeth as a person. It wasn't about. Yeah. It was about her as a person. Okay, interesting. And um, the way that my my turnarounds, because it was a long trip for me, Denise disowns me. Uh, During that time that Denise disowns me and doesn't talk to me is when I work for the Secret Service. I screw over the Secret Service. They find out about it. I take off on a cross-country crime spree, make the United States most wanted list, go to Disney World, get arrested, sent to prison, escape. After the escape, I'm at a county jail in Lexington, Kentucky. My dad comes, they've got a 10 minute visitation. My dad comes to visit and he asks me, he's like, son, can I do anything, anything for you? And I'm like, yeah, you can tell my sister. I said, I love her. Dad gets on the phone, calls Denise, tells her that Denise gets in the car, drives seven and a half hours pregnant to come and see me for 10 minutes to tell me she loves me. Mm -hmm. And, um, after that, they send me out. I spent eight months in solitary confinement, and they send me out to West Texas to a real prison. And I don't see Denise again for like five and a half years. That right there is the first turnaround. It took me two and a half years behind the fence for me to accept responsibility, for me to understand that, hey, I didn't do it for my family or wife or stripper girlfriend. I did it because I chose to do it. I'm the person that put me in prison. Nobody else did. So, um that's the first turnaround. The second turnaround, I get out in 2011. Had no taste of breaking the law whatsoever. Couldn't get a job. They had me on three years probation. Could not get a job. I had job offers from Deloitte, from No Before, from a couple of payment processors. No, you can't take those. Got to where I was trying to apply for fast food. No, that's a computer and you're not allowed to touch a computer. Okay, what about a waiter's position? <laughs> that's a computer and credit cards, idiot. So I couldn't get a job. I was bumming money from my dad and my sister. I was on, on food stamps so I could eat. I had a roommate that was taking care of half the rent for me. And they tell you when you leave prison, if you, um, if you find a job and find something you care about, you probably won't recidivate. Well, what I had that I cared about, I couldn't get a job, but I had this cat. And uh, I had the money to feed my cat and didn't have enough money to buy toilet paper. So I went to the dollar store and bought the cat some food. On the way out, they had this kiosk there that had toilet paper. And that was the first crime I committed when I got out was shoplifting toilet paper. Right back to your roots at the Kmart. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of weird, right? But, you know, I got to say it's I'm blessed that that happened. Because what happens is, is right about the same time, my wife, Michelle, she ends up finding me. Hell, I didn't find her. I'd been dating the exact same type of women again. But Michelle finds me, and I ended up moving in with her a couple months after we met. Uh, we didn't get married, but I finally got a job. And the the only job I could find, my, my probation officer allowed me to get a cell phone. I was going through Craigslist, and they were advertising for landscaping. So I called this guy up, and I was like, hey, man, uh, I'd like to you know talk to you about the job. And he's like, yeah, come on down and talk to me. Well, him and his brother were running the business out of their house. 
And uh, his name was Dustin Doremus in uh, Destin, Florida. So uh, I'm talking to him for about 20 minutes. And finally, Dustin looks at me and he's like, hey, man, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah. He's like, uh, are you on the run or something? And I'm like, no, why? And he's like, well, you just don't seem like the kind of guy that would do this. And uh, so I told him everything, you know, walked him through it. And he was he looks at me. He's like, man, I'm going to have to think about this. So he, he sends me home. That was a Friday evening. Sunday evening, he calls me and he was like, uh, Brett, if I hire you, are you actually going to work? And I'm like, Dustin, if you'll give me a job, I'll work my ass off, man. And he's like, show up tomorrow morning. So I showed up and my job was uh, 10 hours a day, five days a week, pushing a manual lawnmower, $400 a week. And I busted my ass doing that. And uh, you can probably tell by looking at me, I'm not the manual labor type of guy. So I'd come in from work and I'd, I'd pass out, wake up the next morning, take a shower and do it again. I was happy doing it because I was actually doing something. And what happens is the job ends because the grass doesn't grow when it gets cold. So uh, that reason I can commit crime pops up. You know, I've got to prove to Michelle that I'm worth it. I've got to show her that I, she's all in work and I've got to show her that I'm worth it in this this relationship. And I that get it in my head. Provider. Yeah. Right back to I, that. And idiot Brett here, I get it in my head. I'm like, you know, if nothing else, I can bring food into the house. So I get on the dark web, get some stolen credit cards, start ordering food. Well, it turns out the kids need some clothes. So start ordering clothes and it, it starts to grow from there. And I get. So are you using I, like her computer or what? No, a cell phone. You know, I had oh, the okay. cell phone the probation officer okay. kind of allowed me with. Um, so I had that and start ordering food and I get caught on a food order. Uh, Michelle. Had no idea what I was doing. Not a clue. Um, probation office had no idea what I was doing either. The only people at my sentencing for that was Michelle, probation, prosecutor, U.S. Marshals, and the judge. My probation officer, he stands up and he's like, we think this is a one-time thing. We think he's an okay guy. Prosecutor says the same thing. Michelle stands up. I'm crying by this point. Michelle stands up and she tells the judge that I'm a better dad to her kids than their father is. Judge gives me a year. Mm. probation officer stands up and he's like, your honor, if you can, if you can give Mr. Johnson a year and a day, he can get the good time and he get back to his family sooner. The judge amends his sentence. I go back to, back to Texas in prison for, uh, for 10 months. And that's when I find out that Michelle didn't need me for the things that I could give her. She just wanted me for me. And I had never really had that. I'd had it with my sister, but I'd never had it with, you know, you know, in a romantic relationship. I serve my 10 months, get out. They kill probation so I can touch a computer. We get married. Uh, they kill my probation and I can't get a job still because who's going to hire the guy that steals everything. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is I know what my triggers are. Even right now, I know what it takes for me to go back and to commit crime. Back then I knew that, Hey, I'll do so much. I'll go so far until I ramp up and start doing it again. So I looked at Michelle and I was like, let me see what I can do. Reached out. I signed on to LinkedIn and started to reach out to people. And one of the people that I reached out to was this uh, FBI super cop by the name of Keith Malarski. And I, he was involved with, with a lot of the arrests of people that I knew. And I sent him a message. I was like, Hey, uh, Respect every single thing you've done. No hard feelings. By the way, I'd like to uh, I'd like to be legal. And this this agent responded to me within two hours. Took me in under his wing. Gave me references. Gave me advice. He's retired now, but you know what? He still does that to this day. And uh, that was the, all three of those things. You know, my sister, my wife, the FBI. Those are those three big turnarounds. And what mm -hmm. happens is is uh, you know at the same time I I, I make the decision the choice. Because we said it's all about choices. You know, I make the choice to start doing the right thing. And and since that point, I've led a very blessed life. I had the uh, the head of the Identity Theft Resource Council, uh, Dale O'Farrell. He takes me in under his wing. A woman by the name of Carice Hendricks, she gives me my first paid speaking job. Microsoft hears about that and they come in and they hire me as a consultant. AARP hires me as an ambassador. Today, I lead, like I said, I, I lead a very blessed life that I don't really think I deserve, but I'm very grateful to have. And I take my job very seriously about protecting people from the type of person that I used to be. I, I speak across the planet. I consult. I, I worked last year with Arcos Labs. They they made me the first chief criminal officer on the planet. But hmm. I, I work I work hard. I mean, I, I make good money, but I also do a lot of free stuff because I, I really do. I don't want to be remembered as the guy who stole everything. I want to be remembered as the guy who was able to turn this this shit around. So I take it very seriously about trying to protect businesses and people from that type of person that I used to be. Well, congratulations on that, by the way. But it, and as you were talking your way through that, I kept thinking to my this word, the word addict kept coming into my mind. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you do you draw a connection between like an addict might say two things. You take 
the drug, you get a dopamine, you get some type of good brain chemical thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so it makes you want to do it again and do it again and do it again. You said it was all about the cash, but it seems like there was maybe it was about something else too. Like, yeah. Re, the, the, there's other stuff going on there, but do you see those things as being equivalent? And just like you can, you know, an addict can can get clean, a criminal can get, you know, not no longer be a criminal. But you have to understand. You mentioned triggers, but you have to understand what environments, people, opportunities, whatever, get you into a place where you become vulnerable. I guess again, to if maybe I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Or no, I think it is. I think that's very perceptive for you to realize that you know I, I say cash. But it's a lot deeper than cash. It is. You've got you've got ego that's in play, but you've also yeah. got this 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 back this whole backstory. That's the reason I tell it is so that you know. While I say cash, I think it's important that people realize that it's the things that I could do with cash. All right, yeah. cash is just the means to the end. The end is is finding that that love. I did I did an interview yesterday with uh, these professors where they they asked me a question: Do you have friends? I don't. I don't. My, my best friend is my wife. All right. Um, I don't have what people would consider friends uh, because of I, 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 it's hard for me to trust people. It's hard for me to open up to people. I'm an introvert and I fight being an introvert by being this extrovert. You use the word addiction and it is absolutely an addiction. It is absolutely. And I view it as that. Um, I don't say I'm asked by a lot of a lot of press and everything. Would I ever do this again? And I'm hesitant to say no. Because I view this as an addiction, I think if I say no, I'll never do it again. That that opens up that that means that there's a blind spot there. That opens up an area where I have to worry about things. So what I say is is that you know I've not done it, and the longer I go without doing it, the mm-hmm. more chances I have of not doing that. But I, I will never say that I would not. I would say that, and it's like I, I hesitate to say that I'm a good guy. I, I say that I'm becoming a better person. All right. I, I just uh, I, I don't um, I really do view it as and I've been to AA. Um, I, I told a lie to get the drug treatment program in prison because it gave me time off. And that was the best lie that I ever told. It was uh, turns out it was not drug rehab. It was nine months of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, where they teach you that your thoughts determine your feelings, your feelings determine your actions. And if you change the thought process, my God, your actions will change at the end of the day. And I'm, yeah. a, I'm a true advocate of that. I believe that bar none. All right. So I take that seriously. This, the, When you use the word addiction, I think you're absolutely right. You know, an addiction doesn't have to be to drugs or gambling or anything like that. It can be to a person. It can be to crime. It can be anything else like that. I, I think there's a lot of truth that cybercrime especially can be very addictive. You know, you don't have to see the consequences of your actions. You don't have to see the damage that you're doing to your victim. Where if I were to victimize someone in person, I I see the consequences. I see the harm that I'm causing. But cybercrime is such that, you know, you you've got the ego that's there. You've got these communities that that help boost the ego where you have this completely different identity and everyone kind of looks up to you, especially if you're at the top of the food chain. Everyone relies on you. You become a god in that environment. So it it boosts your ego. It's very addictive like that. It's 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 almost a game in in a lot of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've got all these things in play that I, I do believe makes it an addiction. It's very hard to overcome that. You don't see very many people that stop their life of crime to begin with. And you see even less people that stop those uh, those online criminal activities. It's funny you mentioned that you're introverted and you have to sort of force yourself to be extroverted because I was I was been following your social media posts since I first since you and I first talked on the phone. Yes, and you've got a lot of opinions. So you you weigh in frequently. <laughs> About a lot a whole of stuff. range of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is not something I I expect, and you know, I wouldn't expect most introverts to to do. So, is that right. a way that you sort of tell me about tell me about that? You know, I, I do. I'm I'm the guy that um, I do have a lot of opinions, and I could easily, you know, I I don't like to leave the house a lot. Uh, when I when I go on conferences, I'll go down and uh, I'll give my speech and I'll hang around and and answer the questions and everything. But as far as, you know, having dinner and networking with people and, and hanging out like that, I'm like, eh, I go back to my hotel room. When I've had my wife uh, uh, travel with me and things like that, she'll go out. Like if I'm going to a new place, I, I typically just stay in the hotel. 
you know, she'll go out and investigate the city and everything like that. And I'm the guy that's like, yeah, just give me my little Steam Deck or Nintendo Switch. And I'm happy for a while. I do comment a lot on social media. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is I have always been the guy that says the shit that needs to be said, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm this perpetual outsider. If, if something needs to be called out, I'll call it out. Um, it, it's benefited me more than not. It's cost me some jobs, but, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a problem with, uh, with the little guy not being able to speak up. You know, the, like I talk a lot on uh, on LinkedIn about Zelle fraud, mm. and I, I've been told time and time again, hey, none of these banks are ever going to hire you because you keep hammering them. You keep talking about this is not the right thing to do. And my thing is, is everyone knows that the banks could implement proper security, but they're not. Why isn't anyone else calling this out? And the reason is because they're scared of losing a client, a contract, a job, a friend, something like that. And I'm like, no, guys, you got to just tell it like it is. And the pro- the problem is, is that the problem is, is that now that I've turned my life around, I, I'm kind of this black and white guy. I don't see things in gray a whole lot anymore. So it's like, call it out, say it what it is, be truthful, let the chips fall where they may. Um, so it's, it's, it's that motivation of, you know, somebody has got to say what needs to be said. And I, I try to be fair across the board. I do. Um, uh, but I am opinionated. There yeah. is that, but I, I try what, to be open-minded as well. From what I've seen, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's fine. It's great. It's fine to have an opinion, but you're not a dog. You're not dogmatic. You're I try a, not to be. At least I haven't seen that. You know, if, if so, someone if someone tells me something, if I'm wrong about something, I will admit, hey, you're right. You're absolutely right. I see your point of view and and, and go like that. If if and and sometimes it's hard to swallow that pride. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, yeah, you're right. I was wrong. So yeah. Were you a leader when you were in prison? Yeah. That was the weird thing. Um, so I was at Big Spring when everyone found out that I was a Secret Service snitch. And um even there. I, I was not the guy that uh, that bowed down to anyone that joined gangs. I had my own, you know, I, I just did my thing and people would tend to follow. Um, certainly by the time I got to, I did my drug uh, drug abuse program at a place called Fort Worth. And at that point, I was absolutely one of the leaders of that program. Um, okay. And it, it boils down, I don't, I don't, I don't try to be a leader, but um, it, it boils down to just not following what people want. I think that, that, that you follow what's healthy, but I don't think that you should be a sheep that you shouldn't. I don't think that you adopt people's opinions that you, I think that you, that you form your own opinions. Those may agree with other people, but you don't, you shouldn't have pundits tell you what to do or tell you what to think. And I think that's a lot of what's wrong with society these days. And when you first when you first got out of prison, when you said, you know, you got your cat and all of that was, yeah. was there anyone there to, to meet you? Yeah. My dad, my dad was okay. the guy who helped me escape from prison. I used him. I manipulated him into doing that. And, uh, he met me when I was out of prison and he had been doing some of the tax fraud stuff. So, um, he had some cash for me and all that, but that was, um, you know, the thing is, is that you're released from prison with the exact same tools you go in with. And while mm-hmm. I didn't, I had no taste of breaking the law, that didn't mean I wouldn't accept some criminal proceeds. Those were, uh, you know, I I was completely, and I do mean completely just lost, listless, didn't know what the hell I was going to do, anything else. And it was, it was, it was destined, almost destined for me to go back to prison. That's why I was saying, you know, I, I made that illusion earlier that I had been dating the exact same type of women I had been dating. I was in the exact same mindset I was prior to going into prison. Um, it took those turnarounds for for meeting my wife, recidivating on that, and then finally uh, reaching out to the FBI. If if Keith Malarski, if that agent had not responded, I truly believe I'd be back in prison for 20 years. He mm-hmm. gave me that validation. I mean, he really did. Uh, Michelle, Denise, Denise uh, caused me to accept responsibility. Michelle showed me what a, and continues to show me what a healthy relationship is. And then that FBI agent gave me that validation that I needed that, hey, you can choose to be a legal person and mm-hmm. it'll be OK. Um, so all those things together, it took all those people uh, and and me, me, me making that decision to to turn my life around. It took all those people to to 
end up me being where I am today. And at the same time, you know, I, I, I've got a, a great support group, the safety net of people that, uh, that consistently check in on me. And I, while I don't have friends, I have people that care about me. And that, that means a lot. You know, it really does. I, I, I cannot, uh, I used to be a very, you know, the loner type of guy. Yeah. And I still am to a large degree, but I've still got, I've got a lot of people out there that consistently check in on me and they care about me. And they, they, I've gained a lot of respect in this industry now of being the guy that will call things out that uh, I know what I'm talking about. And, and, you know, it took a few years, but people really realize that, Hey, I'm serious about, you know, trying to help people. You know, mm. I go out of my way from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, I tend to be working all the time. Do you think you'll ever go back into acting? You know, I got to tell you, I, um, that's an interesting question. Usually I'm asked, uh, you know, do I have any regrets? And I, the answer is going to be the same. No, I, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be doing exactly the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. There's not a hmm. doubt in my mind about that. Um, I think that, you know, my entire history of everything that's been done to me, everything that I've done to other people. Um, has led to me being able to do what I'm doing today right now. I love stage acting. I do. Um, but I'm able to get on stage now and not only have fun on stage, but also be truthful on stage to me and other people. And, and there's this whole growth thing, not just with me, but you know, the people that I talk to that it resonates and that's much more effective than going by somebody's script kind of in mm. play or something like that. Yeah. You're the character yeah. and it's your script. Right. You know, the thing about acting is you're always you're always looking for truth on stage. And uh, what I do now is all about truth on stage. So I, I'm doing what I want to do. More truth every time. Every time. Every, every time. time. Well, Brett, thank you so much for spending so much time with me today no. and, and sharing your story. And wow. What's the best place for people to I mean, I mentioned your website and stuff earlier, but what's how do you want people to connect with you and who should be connecting with you? Hey, you know, you know, the thing is, is that, um, you know, I talk a lot about cybercrime, uh, identity theft, cybersecurity. I do that. That's that's my lane. But my other lane is this this journey that I've got about trying to become a better person. So I talk a lot about that in my shows as well. So you can contact me on LinkedIn. You can reach out on my website, www.anglerfish.com. You can find me at The Brett Johnson Show. I'm on Spotify. I'm on iTunes, some of these other podcast platforms as well. I will tell you this, if, if you reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter too. If you reach out to me, I'm going to connect back with you. If you ask me a question, you may have to chase me down a little bit, but I promise you, I will respond. I mean, that I, I, I just believe if someone takes the time out to connect with me and ask me a question, I believe that uh, that not responding and not following you guys back, I, I don't think that that's the proper thing to do. I think that it just shows mutual respect for me to, uh, if you're going to take the time to listen to me and engage and you ask a question... I'm going to answer you back. You may have to chase me down because I tend to be a little busy sometimes, but I will get back with you. All right. So yeah. if you've got any problems or anything like that, if you've got a question, please do reach out to me. I, I take that thing, that stuff seriously. And I'm, we're living proof of that because I reached out <laughs> and you reached out right away in a very unique way. So <laughs> Brett Johnson, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for bringing me on. I appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the show. And before you go, I just have three requests for you. One, if you like what I'm doing, please consider subscribing or following the podcast on whatever podcast platform you prefer. If you're really into it, leave me a review, write something nice about me, give me five stars or whatever you feel is most appropriate. Number two, I've got a book. It's called Ownership, How Getting Selfish Got Me Unstuck. It's an Amazon bestseller. And I'd love for you to read it or listen to it on Audible or wherever else, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You can get it everywhere. If you're looking for inspiration that will help you unlock your greatness and potential, order or download it today so that you can have your very own copy. And if you get it, please let me know what you think. Number three, my newsletter. I do a newsletter every Thursday and I talk about things that are interesting to me and or I give more information about the podcast and the podcast guests that I've had and the experiences that I've had with them. You can sign up for the podcast today at my website, which is my name, MikeMalatesta.com. You do that right now, put in your email address, and you'll get the very next issue. The newsletter is short, thoughtful, and designed to inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. 